Welcome, my name is Christy O'Hara. I'm uh, um, on the board for the National Association for Olmstead Parks, and also on the board for the California Garden and Landscape History Society, and I see a lot of our members are here from both groups. Um, I'm a professor of landscape architecture at Cal Poly, and a landscape historian, and it's always interesting to try to figure out how to teach 18 to 23 year olds the value of history when they wanna become a landscape architect. So the part of the discussion today will be, how does history begin to inform contemporary design? And that's kind of my takeaway with this particular project. Um, Frederick Law Olmsted, this is where his second home was, was in Palos Verdes, California. And John was just showing you a little bit of where Palos Verdes was, and he's kind of the anti-cheerleader today. I'm gonna go back to being a cheerleader for Olmsted on this particular project, so I thought it turned out beautiful. Granted, it's for wealthy people, but that's not always bad. I think we can get some good takeaways from it. So again, it was his personal home, and I want you to begin to think about some of the design um, it, the design opportunities that he took advantage of through the course of 20 years of this project that as landscape architects we can use today in planning. So John kind of showed you where Palos Verdes was, but for those of you that don't live in this particular area, you can see through that red arrow that peninsular little shape that Palos Verdes is in between Redondo Beach and about Long Beach, kind of in that particular area in the southern part of um, Los Angeles County. The town itself was the largest new town developed at the time, 16,000 acres. And this, show, this photo right here that was taken in 1900 really doesn't show how storied the land use was at this period. We've had um, Portuguese whalers, we have Japanese farmers, we had Mexican, Mexican ranchos, all using the same land. Yet when we look at it in 1900, you still see almost nothing else developed on this site before the Olmsteads began their project. The thing I think that's important to understand about Palos Verdes is the climate. So we're in a Mediterranean climate down there, and the way that that is defined is that we have a lot of heavy winter rain. So all of our rain comes between October and usually April. By the time Easter comes, we don't really have rain again until October. So it's a very hot, dry summer. And there's very few regions around the world that share that same ecology. This particular part of California, you can see Mediterranean is also um, similar. And if you've ever been to the Mediterranean Basin, Italy, Greece, southern Spain, um, but also in places like Western Australia and Chile have the same ecology. So it's important that you kind of envision what this landscape looks like when you don't water it, because most of Los Angeles is a watered landscape today. Here's the sales office. And uh, when Frank Vanderlip, the developer, purchases this land, he's the first one of those land use owners who sees the ocean view as really the beautiful piece that they're gonna design for in this particular project. It's eventually called the Palos Verdes Project, and it's designed over the course of about 20 years. One thing, that too, that the Olmsteads were doing is trying to figure out, in terms of regionalism, what does California design look like? So they're going to begin to aggregate all these different places in the Mediterranean to kind of try to come up with some of these answers for what's an appropriate design. This is what Palos Verdes looks like. Torrance is in the red lines at the very top. You can see the, um, the oil um, drilling that's going on in that part of Los Angeles at the time. But the design itself was completely designing out the 16,000 acres at the very onset, including all the addresses for people that were gonna buy lots there. So it's completely planned. We can see the roads go in, and so the roads are really going in gently on, into the terraces and the, where the topography really allowed for roads with a minimum of grading. The vision really comes from all of the people that are involved in this project. Frank Vander Vanderlip is the one that's on the left. And what he envisioned was a high-end residential colony that he felt the site really was reminiscent of the Amalfi Coast, where he had traveled before. He sees that as the same vision. Uh, Myron Hunt, he's the chief architect for this project. And he really has, and by the 1920s, comes to a very distinctive type of um, architectural practice. He's trying to create California architecture. And the way that he creates this different kind of architecture that's supposed to be unique just to California is he blends eclectically Moorish design, Mexican, um, Italian, and Spanish together. And so if you ask architectural historians what these buildings are, it's like, well, it's a whole bunch of uh, different stuff. But that was really the intention, was this eclecticism. 
the city planner on this project was Charles Cheney, and what he was trying to develop were these village types based on Mediterranean or villages based on Mediterranean typologies. So when we look at these villages, you're going to see the arcades, the pieces that would look like it's from the Mediterranean, yet you're going to see an American planning model brought in also. This is the Olmsted Brothers firm. Bill Deverell kind of spoke about it at the beginning, and for those of you that I know at the Washington, D.C. first conference we had, a lot of people think that Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. is the same person as Frederick Law Olmsted Sr., and they don't really understand the relationship of these people. Um, Olmsted Sr. has a brother named John, and John marries Mary Perkins, and they have John Charles, who is one of the brothers, and that's why they have such a difference in age. When Olmsted Sr.'s brother dies, um, he marries his widow. So it was really convenient. She didn't have to change her name. She didn't have to change any kind of monogram because now his nephew becomes his stepson. And so he and Mary have a child together, Frederick Olmsted Jr. And so the brothers are half brothers, but there's only one brother by 1920, but there's so much change with the, the name of the firm, they just go with it. The person that never gets any credit is Fred Dawson. The people that were part of the principal, the principals within this firm were regionally based. And so they had people stay in particular parts of the country and work on designs in that area. So if you study the design of Seattle and Portland and California, you're going to see Fred Dawson's name on there. So he's our unsung hero of the Olmsted Brothers firm. Their father had really begun to test regionalism in California from places like Stanford University where we can see that those of you that are on the um, tour tomorrow are going to get a lot more of this history. But to say the color of the stone, that's this yellow um, color is supposed to match those hills. We have this yellow landscape, which you're not really seeing today, but we really have a yellow landscape eight months of the year. And so the color of the stone was a way to blend back into that native landscape. If you go to Oakland or in the Piedmont area, Mountain View Cemetery was a design by Olmsted as well. His intention was to leave it yellow, but the Victorians that received these plans actually built reservoirs to make sure it didn't look dead. They wanted a green landscape. So if you go there today, you'll see the spatial layout that was designed by Olmsted Sr. with the green, lush, magnolias, kind of wet landscape that goes with it. But his intention on both of these projects was really to focus on this native landscape and how beautiful it is. This is Mr. Olmsted's house. So one of the things that makes this project very different from the other projects that they designed was that one of the requirements of the developer was that one of the principals had to live on site during the construction. So in the 1920s, Olmsted um, decides he's going to retire. 1926, he has these ideas in the letters of maybe retiring, which he never really did. But he thought he could live here with this beautiful view. Um, we also have um, Fred Dawson building a house here, and also George Gibbs, another one of the landscape architects for this firm. And I think what's interesting about this project is not only is one that they're designing, but it's their personal home. So when you see the values in this place, you're going to see the values of what they think their home should look like at the same time that as professionals are designing, designing a place that they think is appropriate. Like all of their projects, they start with a really intense research and understanding of the place. And I think part, that's my, one of my number one takeaways, at least for my students, is you have to go really deeply into understanding these places before you ever make a change, because sometimes those changes are unwindable. They're directors of design in this particular project, which means that they're in charge of all the plans. So you can see in this image here, um, they're starting to draw how this landscape is going to be developed before they make some changes to it. 1914, when they begin this project, they do a lot of climate studies. So climate studies, you know, what are the temperature ranges here? Um, how much water do we get? It's very, very little water, especially if you're coming from the East Coast where you're used to having 50 inches of rain. Here you have to irrigate your landscape most of the time if you want it to live, at least get started. So they're really trying to understand this place. And in order to understand the plants, they go to, um, to uh, Theodore Payne, who's a native plant specialist in California, and ask him to give them lists and tell them how to propagate plants that are native and adapted to this California landscape. 
And then by 1915, we see the propagation of these plants. The Olmsteads didn't believe that people that were coming here, a lot of them was a second home, would know how to use the plant, so they pre-planted some of the trees onto the sites because they just felt they're going to put something too wet into this dry landscape. So they used the nursery to start planting the, the um, community before the people bought the lots. Olmsted writes in Landscape Architecture magazine in 1927 his new approach to design on this particular project. What he wanted to do was to first look for areas that were naturally adapted to the particular land uses of what he was going to do. Business centers need a certain type of landscape. A golf course needs another type of landscape. Um, the canyons and steep hillsides he was going to use for a multifunctional purpose and oftentimes are used as parks. All of the green you can see on here is the green space that's linked throughout Palos Verdes. The design of this particular community is completely driven by the landscape and climactically similar places. So if we look at this uh, Ravello, Italy, for example, look at how similar these two uh, Italian hill town and a California hill town typology look. We've got the red tile roof, we've got the way that the massing of the of the buildings go in, and we see the vegetation having a sim similar spatial pattern. And you saw the before pictures, there were no trees here before. So now they're beginning to massage those trees in. And the trees begin to cool down this landscape too, as well as beautify it. These are some early sketches by the firm because they wanted to create five different villages within Palos Verdes. And each of these villages, they wanted them to be somehow linked together architecturally so we can see the arcades that are used that make them all look similar, yet each one would have a unique identity. So each of these villages that were sprinkled along the way at two miles apart from each other um, would be unique within this community. The, the design of open space, which we don't often think of open space as being designed. We think it as being maybe left over and someone forgot to design something over there. But here it was really intended to have special purpose. So while some of these spaces you would think that's you know beautiful ocean view, we should let that be the high-end development, they actually didn't allow it to be developed at all. And I'll show you why. By keeping that open space already there, they began to showcase the native landscape. So that was one of their personal focuses. And then secondly, I was telling you how all the water in California drops at the same time of the year. So we've got a massive amount of water. We don't have it spread over the course of the year where you might have a gentle rain, say like in places like Seattle. Here we get it all at once since we have major issues with erosion and what to do with that storm water. What they did, and you can see in these green spaces, is the way that the site is graded, grades the stormwater runoff from the streets into open space. So there we can go and we can infiltrate the water and make it be usable, not put into storm drains. So it's a very careful way of thinking about the grading before any of the streets and things like that were developed. This is the entry to Palos Verdes, and at the time it was the largest unirrigated landscape in the, in the country. So we've got 16,000 acres being pre-planned, unirrigated, and it looks how lush it is. But it's because they're choosing the right plants. They're choosing plants that are appropriate for this particular place. Another important thing about living in Los Angeles and being a resident is they had a good understanding of the people. And the people, as you know, in Los Angeles really love their cars, even in 1920. 1920, we have the highest per capita of car use in Los Angeles, so they knew that whatever they did had to, do, had to have something to do with the car. If you do any research, what you're going to find are a bazillion plans on roads. They started with so many plans on roads, trying to figure out roads, and these surveyors right here are developing contour lines that are very small, three to five feet apart, so that they could really understand the, top, the topography of this particular place. And we can see in the drawings below, there's going to be a very wide use of the road because it's going to have multifunction. What they did by finding out those topographic lines was how to gently put these roads back into that landscape without a lot of grading. Often you'll see giant cuts in the landscape, and that's because it was too steep for where you had to put the road. But they're trying to avoid most of those cuts and try to weave these roads that they're going to need gently in there. And you can see how they kind of a serpentine line of it working in. 
The streets were then designed really widely, 200 feet wide, which gives us multiple options of what to do with the road. So we've got a place for obviously the cars, but also for pedestrians, for horses. And then there was also an idea early on of an early railway, an electric railway that would have gone down the center in a median as a way to reduce kind of the harm on the landscape and have a quick way to get between these villages. So here's one of these villages. The Olmsteads would never have called it walkable. That's our own coining of having some kind of adjacency that's appropriate for humans who don't like to walk that far. But what we can see in the yellowing areas are the location of residences, the location of their commercial district, their school, their library, and parks. We're all within a walkable distance. And then a two-mile drive takes you to the next set of villages. So there was a set of communities that were um, self-sustaining within each of these um, groups of villages. Residential design at this time, and still today we, in many parts, is a gridded landscape. And if we look at the grid of this San Francisco landscape, that's about the least city I can think of that needs a gridded landscape. And if you've tried to park there or gone over the cliff, that was the one city that someone should have looked at topography lines before they kind of put this net over the top and called it good on the city. But the Olmsteads were going to look at maybe, maybe that's not the right thing to do when you have a really um, steep site. So instead, look at the way that the lots are broken up. So the lots are following the topography of the site, but they're also an unusual shape. The intention with the having that unusual shape, well, on the one hand, is not very democratic, and Thomas Jefferson would have probably had issues with that. But what it did is it forced everyone to look at how they would use their lot differently. So based on this shape, based on this um, topography, how are we going to put the building and the landscape onto the project, onto this lot? Additionally, they also had requirements that you couldn't put a house bigger than 30% of its scale on the lot. So we have a lot of open space between the buildings. So that was an important part of the CCNRs. And what it looks like at a street level is the houses are going to jog. You're never going to see the front doors all lining up because each lot is a different shape and has to be responsive to that lot with the design. So it gives a different kind of character to the way that these um, neighborhoods are developed. Within that residential design, too, we see that they have to do a lot of terracing. So on the one hand, it's an ecological approach. We've got terracing to reduce that erosion. But the terraces become part of the landscape design. So we've got the building terracing on the site. We've got the, the walls terracing. And then if we look at the materials that are being used, they're using Palos Verdes stone. So if you see a flagstone in here, that's the stone from that particular area, which also gives it a sense of place when you use those regional pieces of, of um, the material. And then instead of having the large front yards of grass, instead we see interior court spaces, which create an indoor-outdoor experience with the design as well as an outdoor room. So a lot less turf than most projects. If I had a pointer, which I thought I was going to, I could tell you where I'm going with this particular slide. Is there? So I just want to show you, this was the design for, oh, here, I, I need, this is my IT specialist. I was having my students come help me. Which one? This one? Oh, you can't see this at all. You can point for me. So this is the design of Palos Verdes. Malaga Cove, I'm sorry for you guys way over there, you have to get your binoculars. It's up in that top left corner is the area that I'm going to talk about. Like a lot of projects, you know, you have great ambition, it's going to be built, we got it all planned, but then something bad called the Depression came along. And so the only part in Palos Verdes that's designed per plan by the Olmsted brothers, thank you very much, is Malaga Cove, that particular village. The rest of these villages end up being sold off to different developers, and so you'll see cities of Rolling Hills Estates, you'll see the cities of Rancho Palos Verdes, all separate, not really having the same kind of design idea but that's what the rest of that peninsula looks like, 1950s development. And as an aside, Rolling Hills Estates, you know, is one of the most expensive communities in the world. But um, when they sold it off, they were giving them the land facing east, where all those torrents, you know, oil ducts were. They thought that was their worst land. So they sold that off. They thought it was their cheapest that they should give. It didn't have ocean views. So that's kind of funny to me. Anyways, um, Malaga Cove. 
So this is the entrance, as I showed you again with Malaga Cove. The eucalyptus that were talked about that, you know, everyone in California was planting these eucalyptus groves, which are like a planting poison oak. It's just not a good tree. I've never planted one as a landscape architect. I've only suggested their removal. But they kept them, and we can see that that's creating the frame that they want. The frame, when we look at the, um, the drawings that they're doing of this, creates that entrance that they want into the city. So we're coming from Redondo Beach and um, driving into the city. And as I can't show you with my pointer very well, we're going to drive up this road, and the first commercial district is going to be around that first large bend. So there's the first commercial building, the Gardner building, and our first village. And this will be one of the first kind of buildings that you'll see going into the development. It's um, Andalusian architecture. We've got um, our post office, our library, and our first commercial district right here. And I think this is kind of funny. Here's everybody showing up in their car on the first day for opening day. We've got a little traffic jam going in Palos Verdes. Within the plaza spaces, we've got these Mediterranean plazas, yet look at the way a, an American model, a planning model, uses that same space. So unlike, say, Spain, here's another courtyard space. It's pedestrian. But when we move into California, it becomes, yeah, it looks like in Italy. We've got the Italian sculpture, but at the same time, it's a parking lot. So they have to rethink spatially some of these Mediterranean typologies to make sure that it matches modern culture. So here's more of that commercial space. No turf. We've got um, all the right-of-ways planted with native and adapted plants. And what it does, too, is by using those plants from that place, it begins to blur into that uh, un unplanted, unirrigated landscape in the back. So we're going to go around the corner of Malaga Cove and up to the top. And at that, focus, that focal point, like that campus drive view that you saw on the way in, that's going to be the park I want to show you called Farnham Martin Park. This was taken on Google Earth recently. So you can see how much Palos Verde still looks like the 20s. The place for that park is right here. We can see how small that lawn is. So it's on axes, but a very small circular lawn just above the commercial district. It's a Moorish design in this particular park. But look at the, le the least amount of grass that's needed. They were looking at grass that was really at, a, at an um, active amount. How much grass does somebody need to play? And then what they did was by planting the edges in those native plants, it begins to blur the line into that borrowed landscape that's right above it. And so designs like this, we see how that planting above it is unplanted, but the planting in the park is the cultivated design. And it's a way to blur those two things without overplanting and overwatering. Myron Hunt designs the library that eventually goes in. And so we can see the walls of that. Um, part going in, and there's the first library. Actually, I just did a restoration plan for that particular library. They restored it to the 1930s Olmsted Brothers planting plan, which was really fun. Um, and Olmsted, or Myron Hunt, the other house that he developed, the other building he developed in Palos Verdes was um, Olmsted's home. So here's his house on the cliff. It's kind of a sad story. An earthquake came and kind of took off part of the cliff. And as a landscape architect, you probably should have known not to be that close. And his house eventually had to be demolished in the, I think in the 40s, early 50s. But I won't tell you that part. There's his house. You can see how close it is to the edge of this cliff. And he's certainly not going to have anybody in his view. This is the plan for his, um, for his personal home. And what we can see, the ocean side is the grass but not a lot of grass, not a lot of turf, so very flat um, kind of plant use in that particular area. But now we've got a large orchard and a large native and uh, Mediterranean adapted perennial garden, and that's what's kind of on the top in the long axis line. And looking at the house itself, Myron Hunt takes the Mexican adobe typology to build this house. And what that means is it's a single room, sing single linear room, um, set of rooms so that the wind can blow through the whole thing. When you open up both sets of windows, you don't need an air conditioner if you can have ocean breeze blow through it. And then this is what Olmsted's garden looked like. So clearly he still liked kind of an English style. And then here is it grown in a little bit more lush design with not hopefully too much water. He's trying to be a good example. 
Here's him walking down his um, sidewalk next to his house. Palos Verde stone used in the walls, in the steps, and also in the courtyard spaces. And then this is his backyard view. So what is its relevance today? This is in case you've fell, fallen asleep, this is time to wake back up. Uh, relevance today. Setting the ecological process of place before you begin any kind of design. Really understanding how this landscape works. Because every landscape is different. Every place is different. And so if we understand that clearly before we begin, that'll make a big difference in terms of our stewardship. They also looked at natural systems, like how does it rain? When does it rain? Why is it hot? When is it hot? And begin to adapt that to modern culture. So they get these beautiful architectural and landscape designs. Um, yet we're working with the systems, the ecological systems that are in place. Intensive approach to the infrastructure, thinking about the grading and minimizing the grading so that we don't have a lot of um, runoff and other issues that go with it. And understanding that those social, those natural systems don't have to be over-engineered. We're probably going to hear more about the Los Angeles River and the, the drawing on the bottom right of render four is one of the drawings from that particular proposal of what to do with that LA River. And those of you that have seen Grease and other movies have seen what happened to the LA River. It's in a channel, in a big concrete channel. But the intention was a really gentle, um, non-over-engineered process. Go. Um, they dismissed the common solutions, like that um, park that we usually see as being a large pastoral central park, began to rethink what parks should look like in California, and really began to think about new ideas for what was appropriate here. So here's Palos Verdes today, and after 90 years, you can see that they've kept all of the historic structures, everything is still in place, um, including in this last um, slide, even the CCNRs that were put in place in 1920 is still being, are still being followed today. And so it represents this wonderful example of regionalism that began in the 20s, but really shows architecture, landscape architecture, and planning, and what those kinds of uh, designs can look like that are appropriate in a place like California. So thank you.